The subject of this session is the five theological views of sanctification from the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. And I have to say this is a somewhat technical subject. I do have notes available, and anybody that wishes to contact me can have a copy of those notes very gladly. I'd like us to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and we just read some verses from verse 12. Hebrews 12 and verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Make straight paths for your feet. The command here, the imperative, is that we should follow. That word means pursue, follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. This is a command, this is a call, this is something that we have to obey. The word follow is a picture. The picture given is of chasing an animal in a hunt. This is a description of the process of sanctification as we pursue holiness. Holiness is not something that happens as an event, and it's done and it's finished. Holiness is something we are to follow, we are to pursue, we are to chase after. This is something that we have to have energy and application as we desire to be more and more like our Saviour. So in this session, we're going to look at four different views and then we will come to the reform view, which is covered in other sessions in more detail. A view of sanctification is an explanation of how a believer matures, how they grow in grace and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ in holiness, in purity, in character, and how our behavior, our conduct, gradually changes as the Holy Spirit works within us, as Christ dwells within the Christian life. So we're going to look at a number of views. And that text is helpful because it's clearly a progressive uh, process. The life of the believer is not suddenly made clean and pure, and yet in one sense it is. There are two kinds of sanctification. There is what we call theologically a positional sanctification. It's accomplished at conversion. This is a legal term. We are declared righteous in and through the blood of Christ. His life has been given for us, and therefore at the point of conversion we are declared righteous as we're justified. But then the process of sanctification begins. That's a conditional process. It's ongoing in the life of the believer. Now most people agree that the process of sanctification is progressive. It grows within our life, a gradual process designed by God to make us increasingly dependent upon him and this goal that we should be holy without which no man shall see the Lord. That's the goal of every new heart, of every new creature, of every one that's come to Christ. We now have a heart that desires and pursues and chases after, like the hunter, uh, a state of growing sanctification. But the problem comes, not so much that there is not a progressive sanctification, but the question that people struggle with is how and when and who is responsible in this ongoing process. So we've said there are five widely held views or models 
which seek to explain the scriptures and tell us what this process is all about. There are the four, and then we will come to the reform model. It's our conviction that the reformed model is the right model. It's the time-tested model. It's the model, until we look at the first four, which was believed by the Puritans and down through the years. It was the way that this process was understood. So we're going to look at these individual models. This is an important subject because the way we view sanctification, the myth, the method, the how, the when, the who, has very significant implications upon the life of the, the believer and also upon the church because sanctification is not just within an individual, it's also amongst a body of believers. We help each other. We're shaping one another. We're challenging one another. We're seeking to edify one another and we want to grow in grace as a local body of believers. So we look at the first model and this is called the Wesleyan model. It's after John Wesley. His dates were 1703 to 1791. His brother, Charles, is the prolific hymn writer, but John was the one that taught first this concept which has led so many astray and has caused the other views to be formed. We shall see that they are a progression of the model which John Wesley taught. His model is sometimes known as Christian perfectionism. He wrote these words, we should not be content with religion that does not destroy all the works of the devil and sin in a believer. We should not be content, we shouldn't be happy, we shouldn't be satisfied with a religion, with a faith that does not destroy all the works of the devil and sin in a believer. That's a very important quote. Now, in order to arrive at that conclusion, he takes a number of shortcuts. He teaches that in this life, we will never be delivered of the possibility of sin, but we can be delivered from the necessity to sin. Now, in order to make that shortcut, he also has to take another shortcut. He qualifies his definition of perfection, Christian perfectionism. He qualifies it by narrowing it to purely sin which is intentional, willful acts of sin, as we shall see. And therefore, by implication, that anything that we do that's unintentional is not sinful. So he uses these two shortcuts. He uses the shortcuts in order to come up with this concept that the Christian can live a victorious Christian life. Victory over sin is possible in the Wesleyan model. The Christ life has been implanted in believers by the Holy Spirit, we shall see how. Now in John Wesley's life, he once attended a church in London. It's called Aldersgate, it's still there today. And this was very much the second crisis experience which John had. It was pivotal in his life in establishing for Wesley the need for a second blessing, this term, a second blessing. We shall see that again and again in the other three models. The concept that you are converted, but you don't yet have the Holy Spirit. You're not yet living a victorious Christian life. And therefore, you need something else. You need to have another crisis experience so that from then on you can live the victorious Christian life. There is conversion, the first work of grace, and then there is a second crisis. And at that point, and from then onwards, this concept of Christian perfectionism can begin. He has some other terms. 
Entire sanctification is one of them. Christian perfection. Perfect love toward God and toward human beings. Perfect God in intention. Willfully desiring to be perfect. So he speaks of these two crises. Now he has an important statement. He calls it his plain account. And in this document, he establishes this concept of entire sanctification. He asks a couple of questions. What is Christian perfection? His answer, loving God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So the suggestion is in his answer that it's about our intention and desire. Now that's a noble desire, but it doesn't mean that we always keep it. It doesn't mean that just because we have the intention, we have achieved perfection. He has another question. Can any mistake flow from pure love pure intention and his answer many mistakes may consist with pure love some may accidentally flow from it i mean love itself may incline us to mistake a third question how shall we avoid setting perfection too high or too low now this is very concerning Clearly the standards of God set perfection. Perfection by definition is keeping all the laws of God in thought, in word, in deed. How can we even contemplate that there is a lower form of perfection? His answer, by keeping to the Bible and setting it just as high as the scripture. Well, we see that this first view of sanctification, the Wesleyan model from the 18th century, this is very much the start of a departure from the historic model of sanctification. Other variations will follow, and core to its approach is that post-conversion sin, it doesn't come from within. Within my heart, I can have pure intentions pure desires and the only sin that i'm involved in in this victorious christian life comes from the outside it's a way of minimizing sin and my responsibility he's redefining the sin nature in the life of the believer once in his definition the believer has become spirit filled filled this second crisis experience when the Holy Spirit enters the life of the believer and entire sanctification and the start of Christian perfection begins. From that time, once sin has been minimized, the sin nature, to just that which comes from the outside, the Spirit-filled believer, according to Wesley, has removed that conflict within the heart and the soul, that conflict which we all experience, the battle with sin, the battle with our conscience, the battle between the flesh and the spirit. Let's move on. Let's look at the second. This is known as the higher life, or sometimes known as the Keswick view of progressive sanctification. Keswick is a area of the Lake District, that's in the north of England, and since 1875 there has been what's now a sort of convention meeting each year, I think it's usually during the summer months, it's an interdenominational conference, deliberately so, where people come from evangelical backgrounds and the whole purpose of this conference was to promote practical Holiness. D.L. Moody spoke there in the early years. The practical holiness was the theme that was recurrent year after year. Now the higher life model and the Keswick conference 
In previous years, it's changed somewhat now, we understand, it did not teach the perfectibility or perfection of human beings, but it did teach the possibility of consistent success in resisting the temptation of deliberately violating God's will. And therefore, as we see, it's another teaching of second blessing, the second crisis. They use terms like this. The process goes, we get saved, and then we get serious once we've had a second crisis, once we've surrendered, once we've let go. So if you hear the testimony of somebody that's been converted and then had this second experience through a Keswick meeting, they will often date the two experiences. Such and such was the date when I was converted, and such and such was the date when I fully surrendered. Again, divorcing, justification from sanctification. The terms get saved, get serious, are added to by let go. And then, by faith, let God. Let go, well that's in a sense right for justification. We need to stop thinking that we can save and justify ourselves. We're thoroughly reliant upon the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they then say that the second part, the process of letting God, comes by faith. Sanctification by faith is what they're teaching. Let God sanctify us. Let him, once we've surrendered, sanctify us when we've surrendered by faith. So the key to this second view, this higher life model, the key is trusting, not trying. Resting, not struggling. We don't need to struggle with our sin. We don't need to try to pursue, to hunt after holiness without which no one shall see God. We need to just purely trust, surrender, give in, and let God to do this work. Sanctification by faith in addition to justification by faith. While at this second stage, also in their model, we are taught by them that we come to this filling of the Holy Spirit from that second crisis, very often at a Keswick conference. From then on, we are controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the implications of this model is it's created two different categories of believers. You or I could either be a category one believer or a category two believer, the haves, the have-nots. Those who are merely Christians but carnal and those who've had the Holy Spirit. They're category two believers. They've surrendered. They've let go and they've let God. They've got saved and they've got serious. Now they're living the consecrated, the higher life. That's where the expression comes from. They are now spirit-filled. But in their model, you can relapse. You can go from being a category one believer to a category two spirit-filled and then back again. And then up again. It's like promotion from a football league, one to the next and down again. Promotion and relegation. Once you're consecrated, you're spirit-filled, but if your faith wavers, you can relax and you can relapse into a lower form of Christianity. And they say, well, the problem is you've not let go. You've not let go enough. You haven't got sufficient faith. And the problem with this is it very often leads to great problems with assurance with believers because 
that feeling, that sense that they're living the victorious Christian life, which none of us live all the time, it's gone. And so we start to doubt, well, am I converted at all? I haven't got that sense of victory. I'm struggling. This model as well, it also defines and redefines that we are responsible for known, deliberate sin. So we're seeing that the Wesley model and the Keswick higher life model, they are evolving. Now let's just go through the Keswick method. This is how they did it down through the years. On the first day, they would emphasize sin. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good start. They would express God's holy standards and that we fall short and they would aim to promote a conviction of sin. That's good. The second day, they would explain, and there would be sessions, on God's provision for victorious Christian living, that the Holy Spirit can enter your life. You can have this crisis experience, and the pulling down into sin that can stop. And if only you will surrender, if only you will trust, then you will no longer need to resist. Well, the problem's set in. The third day usually emphasizes consecration in the light of our failure and God's full provision. We just need to surrender unconditionally to God. Well, what a disaster. What assurance problems. I've read accounts of people who have been to those meetings years ago, and they then struggled. It ruined their life. And they struggled from then on in having peace, in believing, an assurance and knowledge that they had peace with God. And then the fourth day was life in the Spirit, and the fifth day emphasized service and turning to the newly prepared heart the saints would then serve and face outward. They didn't need to look inward. They didn't need to battle against besetting sins anymore. Now they could serve God in the power of the Holy Spirit. So that was the Keswick method. Well, we can see that there's a progression. The Wesleyan model, and I'm going to mention a few names so that you understand who's connected with it. Wesleyan perfectionism was also followed by Fletcher and Clark, and it became in the United States the holiness movement in the years that followed. There was what's known as Methodist perfectionism following Wesley more closely, and they had the Palmer Camp meetings, and then there was what's known as the Oberlin perfectionism with people like Finney and Marr. And these two then morphed in the coming hundred years into the higher life movement. And eventually the thesis, the theological model of higher life theology was formed. Well, I just want to use some of the terms because these might be familiar. And we might hear in some of the churches, churches which have been affected by this teaching down through the years. These are the terms that they use, and I just want to contrast some of them. The carnal Christian, the category one Christian, is compared to the spirit-filled, spiritual Christian. The carnal Christian has received Christ by faith, but the spiritual Christian, they say, has received Christ by faith and been given holiness. The carnal Christian is free from the penalty, legally, of sin, but the spiritual Christian is free from the power of sin. Penalty of sin, power of sin. The carnal Christian lives an average Christian life. Well, the spiritual Christian, in their view, has constant victory, constant victory, and is totally surprised by defeat. 
The carnal Christian lives a life in the flesh, but the spiritual Christian lives a life in the spirit. The carnal Christian just has life, but the spiritual Christian has life more abundantly, using that text from John. The carnal Christian only knows Christ as Saviour. Now, this point's very important. But the spiritual, spiritual category two believer has Christ both as Saviour and as Lord. Remember that. There's a controversy that comes out in the coming years. Christ as Saviour only, or Christ as both Saviour and Lord, once we've surrendered our life to the Lord and given everything over to him, now we find that grievously wrong. And it's a great problem. It's called the Lordship controversy. When we come to Christ, we come in repentance and faith. We repent of all sin. And it's at that point we ask the Lord and we desire the Lord to reign over our lives as Lord and Saviour. There is no separation between those two. They speak about believers and the higher grade disciples. They speak about those who are out of fellowship and communion, living a lower form of Christian life, and those that are living the higher Christian life. Now, we recognize some of the church names. There's some of these in and around Bedford. They talk about deeper Christian life, higher Christian life. They talk about the white gowns, and those are symbolic of those who have been perfected, not just legally, but perfected in sanctification because the Spirit is now dwelling within them. The carnal Christian has an unsurrendered life, whereas the spiritual has the life of consecration. Just a few more. The carnal Christian lacks blessing, whereas the spiritual person has a blessed life. Now they use and misuse the analogy of the children of Israel. We once lived in Egypt, in the world. We're all clear about that. But then we come into the wilderness. They define that as a category one, carnal believer. But then we come into the promised land. We come into the place which, according to them, is only about honey and splendor and the victorious Christian life. But that's not what we read in Joshua in those early chapters. We read that there are battles, there are conquests, and the Christian life has many battles, many victories which need to be had over sin. And not all of them are won. They lost the first battle at Ai. They had to go back and trust in the Lord. They had to rely on the provided means. So just to conclude on this second model, Christians experience the second blessing. They move from being a category one to being a category two believer through surrender. Justification by faith, sanctification by faith, as we let go and let God. So the victorious Christian life, according to them, has regular, consistent victory over sin that involves merely a handing over of our lives and a sort of counterfeit, enduring victory to the Lord Jesus Christ and over all sin. Well, let's come on to the third of these models. We'll cover the next two slightly more briefly. The third, which built on higher life thinking, brings us into 
1901-1900, we've moved forward into another century. It's known as the Pentecostal view of progressive sanctification. 1901, Kansas in America. 1906, it was followed by what's popularly known as the Azusa Street Mission meetings in Los Angeles, USA. They taught that sanctification requires a second experience. It's sounding quite familiar. Sanctification doesn't come, it doesn't start at conversion. It comes through the second crisis, a definitive work of grace to cleanse the believer of what they call inbred sin. So that from then onwards, when the Holy Spirit has taken up occupation at the second experience, we become clean vessels. The Spirit's now living within us. Inbred sin has been eradicated and we're now clean. The work of sanctification, according to them, is primarily a work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know it's a work of the Holy Spirit, but our model, our biblical teaching, is that we are involved. It's a partnership. Our duty is to cooperate. Now, that's what they teach. We have some sympathy with that. There is a partnership, but they put more responsibility, more onus on the Holy Spirit. We are purely passive to them. For some of them, they have a third crisis experience, a third blessing, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit evidenced by tongue speaking. That's when this really came to the front. The first experience conversion, the second, the Holy Spirit, and the evidence in almost this third blessing, although some teach only two, is tongue speaking. That's how everybody knows that the Holy Spirit has come into my life because I'm now given this miraculous gift of speaking either in languages or in the heavenly language as they teach. Now some oneness Pentecostals, as they call it, teach that unless you speak in tongues, you are not saved at all. That's the sign of conversion, not just of sanctification, and of the Holy Spirit. So, in this model, we probably have three crises experiences. Conversion, sanctification, when the Spirit comes within the life, and then the crisis of Spirit baptism. For, as they say, power and service and tongue speaking. Now, the Assemblies of God, who are one of the denominations who have taught this. They have in their statement of fundamental truths, point nine, not to get too technical, they say this, the scriptures teach a life of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's good. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we are to obey this command. No, that's not right. Yes, the Holy Spirit helps, but we have an imperative. Be ye holy, for I am holy. They also teach, but they've changed their article. They changed it in 1961, the Assemblies of God, to remove the word entire, to make it slightly grayer. It used to say entire sanctification, completion, perfectionism, complete perfectionism, is the will of God for all believers and should earnestly be pursued by walking in obedience to God's word. So that's the Pentecostal view. Let's come briefly to the fourth view before we come to the Reformed model and draw to a conclusion. This is known as the Schaffarian model the Schaffarian view. It's also sometimes known as the Augustinian view. It's been popularly associated with Dallas Theological Seminary, although my understanding is that in recent years 
they've reverted to a more conventional, reformed position. Key to the Schaeferian view is understanding the biblical term of the nature and the capacity to sin. They speak about two natures of the believer. They speak about the old sinful nature and the new nature. In fact, they've gone on to say that there's possibly three natures. The natural, unconverted person, the carnal person, this is similar to the Wesley model, converted, but with the old lifestyle. And then there is the spiritual person, converted, but spirit-filled. But unlike the higher life thinking, it insists that spirit baptism occurs at conversion, which provides for us this positional sanctification of being in Christ, but also of this being filled with the Spirit and therefore able to be the spiritual person that we ought to be. To be spiritual, it's essential. They teach that you are filled with the Spirit after conversion. This comes through a total submission and obedience to Christ. And in this view particularly, there is a direct link to the Lordship controversy, the distinction between Christ as Saviour and Christ as Lord. Now, the person behind this was a man called Larry Schaefer. He was born in 1871, died in 1952, and he was the professor of Dallas Theological Seminary. Now, it teaches that while all Christians can be said to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, not all have been filled with the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is defined as the unhindered ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. I want to move in conclusion to this fifth reformed doctrine of progressive sanctification and just show the differences with the four other models we covered in some of the other sessions. The doctrine of progressive sanctification as taught in the Word of God. We can say this about this reform position. Sin is any word, any thought, any act that falls short of God's perfect character and his perfect laws. And therefore there is no possibility that any believer can attain perfection in this life. We cannot say that it's just deliberate or willful sin that is eradicated. An unintentional sin does not exist. We teach that justification is legal. That's the position of sanctification that we'll be given, declared righteous, but Sanctification is distinct. At the same time, the two are inseparable. Once we've been justified by faith alone, in Christ alone, the sinner, the saved sinner, now has a desire, an inward desire for righteousness, a desire to be like Christ. We know that we're not righteous of our own, we're only righteous through Christ, but the faith that saves us, the faith is never alone, as it teaches in the letter to James. It's also to be accompanied by the works, the fruits of the Spirit, as we desire progressively to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Our character is not purely changed by the indwelling and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, there are many other ways taught in Scripture through which we attain progress in sanctification as we set our eyes on Christ, as we, as we have more love for him. So increasingly, he desires to dwell within us. Secondly, with the help of the Holy Spirit, 
we have this obligation to mortify the deeds of the flesh. That's clearly taught. I don't need to prove that just now. And then we have the Word of God dwelling within our hearts and minds. We have prayer. We have mutual admonition. There are many other ways in which our character is being shaped. Many other means of grace through which God gives us that opportunity to become more like his Son. The Holy Spirit is given at conversion is what the Word of God teaches. There is no second blessing. There is only one baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there may be other and numerous fillings of the Holy Spirit when the Word of God dwells within our heart, when preaching affects us as God provides means through which we're drawn to love him more and more. So the pitfall really can be summarized as this. The justification texts confused with the sanctification texts. Well, I trust that understanding something of these five views, four of them spanning over 200 years, is helpful in giving us an appreciation of how from Wesley's view these other branches of error were built on and evolved and deviated from the faith once delivered to the saints and from the doctrine of progressive sanctification.